Okay, uh, so we go to chapter 22, and obviously following up on David fleeing from, um, uh, from uh, Saul, and then to, to Nob, and, and then to Gath. And, and now he continues that here in, in chapter 22, and it says this, David departed from there, that would be Gath, and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became captain over them. And there, and, uh, and there, and they were, and there were, what did I say? And there were with him about 400 men. And, and so, so David in, in fleeing, now remember he's now heading back towards Judah, back to, towards Israel, back to probably where he should have been all along. And so he heads to this cave where he's going to be uh, uh, his, his hideout. And, his, and, and so uh, maybe something that's a little bit surprising happens, but what, what begins to happen? What happens here in the cave? People come to him. People start assembling around him. Now, what, what is the pretty much the common thread, would you say? Misery. Yeah, they're suffering in some way. Whatever, whatever it is that, that, that is, whether it's, it's debt, uh, bitterness, bitterness in soul, uh, distress, all the, some, these people are having problems and, they, and they're running to David. It reminds me a little bit of the, the, the scripture and from from uh, the gospel, come to, come to me, those who are heavy laden. Um, and yeah, and I'll give you rest. Uh, Jesus speaking. And they, so in some way, these people are drawn to David. They're, they're coming to him. Uh, and so what this becomes, becomes kind of, as he's, he's now their commander, it says. And so what we see is, is that in the cave, God begins to assemble what is going to be the nucleus of David's kingdom. He's, he's building that at this point. So here's David really on the run, in, in, in hiding out, and in his hideout, God begins this. And as maybe we could look, look at this, as we looked at, he looked for refuge, it, it, in some sense, it, with the priest, but he just was looking for provision. He looked for refuge in Gath, where he pretended to be insane. But maybe now he's finally in the place of refuge where he's really supposed to be. That, that those previous stops weren't places that God really intended for him. But now it seems that maybe this is the place God be, decides to begin building what will be eventually be his, his kingdom. And so these people begin uh, coming around him and they're looking to him. What do you think they, why do you think they're drawn to him? Yeah, they, they had misery loves company. They're, they would say they're, they're in the same boat as him. Maybe they're looking at, we, we, we need, I need hope. I, I need just a glimmer of hope. And if, if David is the, the, the guy that took down Goliath, if he's the one who's really called to be the king, then maybe that's the guy I need to be with. And so, and so they're drawn to him. They're coming to him here in, as he is in the cave. And so I, I think from this, from what we see happening here, I think probably now he's finally to that place of refuge that God really intended for him to be. So back to the verse, to back to the, the, the scripture, verse 3. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother stay with you uh, till I know that God will do for me. Till I know what God will do for me. And he left them and the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. And so what, now what's his concern? His family. He's taking care of his family. Now, why do you think this would be necessary? The king could go after his family. In fact, it seems like a very reasonable thing to assume, wouldn't it be? That, that knowing how Saul is, and especially as we're going to walk through the rest of this text, where Saul is mentally and spiritually, what he's capable of is anything. And, and so David takes measure to make sure that his family's uh, secure. Uh, and, so, and so it says there in verse, uh, uh, did, I, did I say, oh, I read through it, yeah. And, and so what we see here is that uh, he says this, he says, till I know what God will do for me. Now, 
does, if you think about everything that happened in the previous chapter, would, would that phrase have come up? When, when David went to the priest, did he say, I want to see what God will do for me? No, he was, he was just concerned with survival, right? And so there's this glimmer here in, 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 chapter, in, in, uh, in chapter 22, uh, and, and I think also proven by the fact that he's, he's, he's uh, taking care of his parents, he's doing things that aren't just totally self-centered. And so there's this indication that's born out as we walk through this, that David is turning back to God. And so in the cave, David experiences an apparent renewal, uh, renewed commitment to the Lord. Now, we could look at the things that are said, the recording of 1 Samuel 22, and we could maybe make that assumption. But when we look in the Psalms, we get even a, a greater picture of the certainty of that, that, that there are, are, are scripture, scriptures in the Psalms where it specifically speaks. And, it, and if anybody has a Bible, if you turn to uh, Psalm 57, I'm going to read that. But, but if you have, have a, a Bible and you'd open it up, uh, and you look at the, the little heading, it's going to say, it's going to refer to the fact that this psalm was written when David was in the cave running from Saul. And so this psalm, this psalm parallels 1 Samuel 22. What, what, when it, this happened in, in 1 Samuel 22, in Psalm 57, these are the things that David is saying, writing to the Lord at that point. And so Psalm 57 says this, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me, Selah. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. And so Psalm 57, 1 Samuel 22, compared to 1 Samuel 20, maybe 1 Samuel 19, there's a big difference here, right? There's a, there is now an indication that David's concern, his, 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 his faith, his trust now is, is, is on God and not simply him, himself. And so in the cave, he even refers to his refuge as what? Not the cave, what's his refuge? He speaks of in Psalm 57. God himself. God, God is his refuge. And so now he seems to, to be at that place where, where he is not simply trying to survive. He's not simply looking out for his best interest. In fact, we see this also, that in the cave, David begins to demonstrate a concern for people other than himself. Now, what's the evidence of that? Where do we see? He takes care of his parents. He makes sure he gets them in a safe place in Moab. What else? Where, what else do we see a concern for others? Yeah, he let the, the four hundred men. In fact, in fact, it, it sounds like a little bit of a a, a, a rabble. It doesn't sound like a real like uh, hearty group of soldiers, does it? People that were in misery, people that had debt. You know, there's this description of people who just happen to be suffering, and so those are the people that are coming to him and. And, and, and joining up with him. And so David seems to have moved away from that survival mentality into one now who has a concern for other people uh, apart from himself. And so in the cave, he begins to demonstrate that concern for people other than himself. Verse 5 then says, Then the prophet Gad said to David, Do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Okay, so what's significant about this is this, that he's listening to a prophet and he's, he's following through what the prophet says. Now, back one chapter, he went to the priest who was Ahimelech and there's no indication in that that he's asking Ahimelech what I should do. What should I do? What does God want me to do? He simply wanted bread. He just simply wanted fed. And even, even to the point where he's going to put the, the priest all the priests in danger. He, he just, I just want fed. Me and my boys need fed. Now, he, now he's to a place where he's actually going to the priest for counsel. What should I do? 
And so from that, we see this, that in the cave, David begins to seek counsel from the Lord. He begins to look to the Lord for his direction. Where has his direction come from previous to this, or the, at least the last couple of chapters? Yeah, himself. And specifically, what, fear? You know, you know that, that's, that was simply what was motivating him and driving him at that point. Now he's, now he's actually going to the Lord or at least to the prophet, and seeking from the prophet, tr- prophet direction from the Lord. And so, the prophet says, you need to leave the cave, you go into the forest, and what's David do? He goes, he, goes, he does. And so, and so now maybe starting to feel kind of comfortable, I got my, my guys, I'm, I've got this, this kind of fortress, as he describes it, that is the cave, and now he's, he's calling him out of that. And he obeys, he goes. And so, so, so not only does David begin to seek counsel, but he, he's following through with it. In the cave, David begins to take steps of obedience. He's beginning to do what God calls him to do and, and speaking to him through, the, through the, uh, the prophet. Now, Saul heard, now Saul heard, and so most of what we just read there, the first, what is it, five verses, really have to do specifically with David his response as he, as he now has, has found refuge in the cave, has found refuge in God. And now the rest of this chapter is going to mostly now deal with Saul and what, what's happening with Saul, the, the parallel, what, what is going on uh, at, at the same time that David is seeking refuge. This is what Saul was doing. And so verse 6, Now Saul heard that David was discovered and the men who were with him. Saul was sitting at Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height uh, with his spear in his hand and as his servants were standing about him. Now, almost every time we see Saul now, he's got his spear in his hand. Almost every time he's he's got that somewhere nearby. What what does that indicate about him at this point? He's afraid? Betty? He's obsessed with getting David. What were you saying, Rodney? Did you say what? Wendell? You didn't say something? No. Insecure. Okay. Is that what you were going to say, Rob? No. <laughs> you put your hand up and you went, yeah. <laughs> what did you say? The, the, oh, the sword? The sword? Okay, well... Then, then that, that's a means to hang on to the, to the throne in some, in some respect. Yeah, yeah okay. So, so he's, he's in this, this just kind of um, paranoid state, it seems, at this point. And then verse 7 says, And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Here now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Just stop there for a second. Now, now Benjamin... Who was a descendant of Benjamin in the whole story of Israel at this point in history? Saul. Saul was a Benjamite. And so, so the people that are with him, are, are that he's speaking of sons of Benjamin, he's probably kind of surrounded by his clan. And, and so that's the only, only inference we can get from that, that, that it's, this isn't only people of Benjamin, but he probably was predominantly... His, his people that surrounded him were predominantly made up of those. But he's saying, do you think David's going to do for you? And, and, and so what, what, is, what is implied in that? Do you think David's going to provide vineyards for you, for you? What's the implication? That Saul's doing that. That what, what Saul is doing for, for them, do you think David's going to do that? And so he's creating in them what? To, to, to try to do the same thing that he's doing, to protect the kingdom. Don't, let's get, let's get David because he's going to take from us. And, and he goes on to say this, will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, which is probably what many of them were. And so he's really re- reminding them of the power that he has and the ability he has to, to do for them in, in what is best for them. Verse 8, that all of you have conspired against me. No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. So now he's going to bring up what has happened here in the last week or two, whatever period of time. So 
He brings up this idea that you guys knew that Jonathan and David were in cahoots together, and none of you mentioned that to me. Now, I don't know if they really knew that, but there's probably, there's probably rumors, probably an awareness that David and Jonathan were, were very close. And, and so, he, so he's bringing up the fact that, that they have kind of betrayed him in, in his relationship with, with David. No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait uh, as, as it is this day. And so he begins to go on this paranoid rant, uh, 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 really not even connected in, in reality. Because has Jonathan conspired against Saul? No, he hasn't. He has not conspired against him. He has not done anything other than to, to try to see justice carried out in regards to David, his friend David. And so he's tried to protect David, but, but, but Saul has become completely irrational. And that's why he sits with his fear. That's why he's, he's so fearful of what, what's going to happen. Now, he has good reason to be. God has already told him that the kingdom's going to depart from him. But that, that puts him in this, this, this place of sitting on the edge and, and, and his irrational action and, and thought is going to get even worse. And so without the restraint of God's word, which he no longer has, Saul's thoughts and actions become irrational. He's not thinking rationally. Now, I think that, that we could look at the world today. We can look at the things that are going on and, and ideas that are promoted now as somehow normal. And, and I think we could see that this is, this ha this is what happens when, when the world departs from, when the, when the word, world neglects the word of God. When we just go in whatever direction our emotions and our passions take in us, we, we are capable of thinking the, the most insanely ridiculous things, like boys can be girls and girls can be boys. Wh whatever kind of nutty thing that's in the, in the world today it, we, we look at some of that and we think, how in the world could people be so fooled? And yet, when we give in to, to the lusts and the passions of the world and, and disregard what God has to say about things, we're capable of thinking and doing some pretty insanely stupid things. And I, stupid's not even the right word. You know, I, 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 irrational, it doesn't, make, it doesn't make sense. And so Saul moves more and more into that Pattern And that now we're going to see it go full force in what happens next in this story. It says, then answered Dog the Edomite. Remember that name? Dog the Edomite, who was standing in the background listening when Ahimelech gave, provided bread to David. And we mentioned that in this just little kind of passing way in, in chapter 21. With no real indication other than who he is and what he's heard. We don't really know what, where he fits into this story, but now he's going to emerge as, as certainly a, one of the main characters here. Then answered Dog the Edomite, who stood by the servants of Saul, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. And so Dog has spilled the beans on Ahimelech. You remember Ahimelech was nervous. His hands were shaking. And, and now we're going to find out why. Because this is, this is what happens in, in, in a kingdom that uh, has gone off the rails. Then the king uh, sent to summon Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. So he calls them into his, into his chambers and now meeting with them, they found, he's found out that at least in Saul's mind, uh, Ahimelech has betrayed him. That's what Saul's thinking. And Saul said, Here now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, and that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him, so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as, as, as it is this day. So, so what is true about what he has said about Ahimelech? 
He gave him bread, gave him the sword. That, that's pretty much it, right? Inquired for him, uh, inquired to the Lord for him. It doesn't really tell us that in the scripture. But, but, but it's, that wouldn't be un, unbelievable to, to, to think that maybe he did. But, but, but regardless, what about this other stuff? Conspired against me. That to, to you somehow working to overthrow the king. Was, was that a part of the story? No, no, absolutely not. And so, so this irrational thinking, everybody's against me, I'm paranoid, leads Saul to believe that to be true. And, and if we weren't sure about Ahimelech, because chapter 21 is sort of vague in, in what it really tells us, if we weren't sure about Ahimelech and what he really knew and what he didn't know, it really kind of becomes more evident here in this in the scripture. Then Ahimelech answered the king, and who among all your servants is so faithful as David, who was the king's son-in-law and captain over your honor, your bodyguard and honored in your house? So, so he, he points out some important things here. He's your son-in-law. He's your son-in-law. He's, your, he's, he's one of the main guys that protects you in the army. He's honored in your house. He says, you know, you know what, what's the point? Why is he saying that? What's, what's the reason for saying that? Reality check. In, in, in what way? Yes, again, then the same thing that Jonathan tried to do to remind him of, of all that you yourself, speaking of Saul, you yourself have done to, to honor him and, and make him famous and give him great opportunities to, to exceed at, at whatever he, he is, is placed before him in the, in the kingdom. And so he, he's, he's pointing out that, that important element uh, of this. And so verse 15 is today the first time that I've inquired of God for him? Obvious answer to that, no. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. And so, and so Ahimelech basically says what? Yeah, you know what you're talking about. In, 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 in regards to himself, what's he saying? Yeah, I had no idea. I, I had no idea. Now, we, we, if we were to think in that, well, well maybe, maybe he's being dishonest there. But, but I think as we see the story fulfilled, played out, we see, no, this, this is true. He really didn't know the whole picture. He knew David was fleeing. David told him it was a super secret mission. I can't tell you where I'm gone. And, and he provided for him. And so it really seems that that, is the, the case that he really doesn't, doesn't know. Now, do you, think, do you think that he knows the danger in what he is saying? Do you think Ahimelech knows that he's in a dangerous place at this point? Yeah, I think so. I think probably so. So if that's the case, if, if Ahimelech is in a place where where he could lose his life, as he will, in, in a matter of minutes, then, then why would he say what he said? What would, be the, what would maybe be the more expedient thing to say here if you're trying to get out from under this? Maybe you could pull, like, Michael. Do you remember Michael's ploy? He, he's threatening to kill me. He's threatening to kill me. What could I do? I, I mean, something, but, but what, what, uh, what Ahimelech is doing is he's confronting Saul. He is confronting him with, with the truth. And it is that you have honored him, that he has done nothing to deserve what's coming toward, what you're bringing towards him. And so all of that, I, I believe, is a, a sign of, of, of faith and courage in this moment. In fact, probably fully understanding what, what awaits and so Ahimelech confronts Saul and courageously faces the consequences of godly obedience. Now that sounds funny, consequences of godly obedience. Usually we're, we're talking about the consequences of godly disobedience, right? But in, the, in this case, or I guess just disobedience. In this case, there's a consequence to godly obedience. If you're going to do what God says, there's going to be a consequence to it. 
And, and, and so Ahimelech, it seems at this point, is willing to accept that. I'm going to take the consequence of, of living obediently to the Lord. And, and so he's about ready to become a martyr. He's about ready to die because of that, that, that courage that, that he has. And so verse 16, And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. And they knew that he had fled and did not disclose it to me. He's saying that the priests knew that David was on the run, and none of them told me, and so they're all going to die. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. So what do you think? What do you, what, at this point in the story, here, here's, the, here's the, the guys that are responsible here in the, uh, the, around the king. And when the king says, kill the priest, they refuse to do it. Why? Yeah, yeah. There's a fear of the Lord more than they fear the the uh, than they fear the king. That yeah, th- this could end up really ugly for us. But we, we're, I'm not going to do that. What that, what also does that tell us about Ahimelech and David? Yeah, yeah. That they're well thought of, and 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 they're looking at this as a, this is this is crazy. This is this is unjust. In, in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, it, it says this. It says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body, uh, uh, can soul and body in hell. And so here's, a, here's a, a, an illustration of that. They, they, they look at this and they know Saul can kill my body, Saul can take my life, but Saul can't take my soul. And the one who can take my soul will take my soul. And, and so they make a commitment here to stand in, alongside the, 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 the priests. Verse 18 then says, Then the king said to Dog, You turn and strike the priests. And Dog the Edomite turned and struck down the priests, and he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priests, he put to the sword both man and woman, Child and infant, ox, donkey, and sheep, he put to the sword. And so this guy, this guy is capable of anything, isn't he? And so all he needed was one guy. I get one guy who, can, who will do my dirty work for me, will, will take care of this problem. And so, and so he does. This horrific massacre that happens regarding the priests. Now you look how far Saul has fallen that he would get to that point where now he would take out 85 priests plus then go back to Nob and then just wipe the town out. Don't leave anything, anything left there. And so, so what we see is that when godly restraint is removed, the worst of all evil is possible. You know, I, I look at, when we look through history and we see things like, like Nazi Germany, and we look at that and we think, how, how, did, how did that happen, you know? Because, I mean, I mean you could have a Hitler, but, but you, a Hitler's not enough. You have to have a lot of people that are willing to do Hitler stuff. And, and, yet, and yet when godly restraint is removed, it's, it's possible that you can get a lot of people to do a lot of awful things for what they think is maybe their own benefit, maybe to protect themselves, whatever their motivation might be. But when godly restraint is removed, the worst of evil is possible. You can do anything. And, and, and so we, we, uh, we need to understand as we look at our country, we look at the world today, to understand that. People can do horrific things. You look at what happened in, in, uh, in Israel, however many months ago that's been now, and that, that slowly, slowly, people are just kind of changing the, the, uh, the narrative there. Where now, now Israel's kind of, they're the aggressor, they're the bad guy. And yet these people, these people massacred thousands of people, including babies, in, in one day. And now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, we, we need to get rid of, we need to get rid of the prime minister of Israel. Nobody's talking about that for 
for, for the people that lead Hamas. But no, we need, we need the, they need a new prime minister. We need a, we need a ceasefire. And, and, so, and so worst of evil possible when godly restraint is removed. And I believe that's the world that we live in today. G.K. Chesterton said, The issue is now clear. It is between light and darkness, and everyone must choose his side. So, so think about the, uh, the, the, the soldiers here with Saul. They, they have a very, their choice is made very clear for them, isn't it? It's like, okay, you kill them, right? And so you're right there. Okay, I, I, gotta, I, gotta make a, I gotta make a choice. I gotta decide to do the right thing or the wrong thing here. It's, it's very defined for them in that, in that moment. Most of us, our choices are much grayer than that. And we can even justify sometimes choosing darkness over light. But, but sometimes the choice becomes so clear, so defined, that it, it is so obvious. And that's the case here. And so when it comes to that we look at the injustice and, and the awful evil that's going on in the world today, Sometimes it is absolutely crystal clear, and, and we have to make sure that we always choose light. And so we go back then to the, the story here in, in, in verse 20. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahiatab, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. Now, if you were to look back at, at where we were at months ago in 1 Samuel, I think it's chapter 3, chapter 2, I think it's chapter 2. When, when Hophni and Phinehas and, and Eli are making a wreck of things, uh, Samuel says to him that, that you're, you're going to be destroyed and there's going to be one guy left. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But it seems like this might be the case. It might, this might be that moment. Because what happens is this guy, this one man, Abiathar, escapes. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And, and David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Dog the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. What's David saying there? This is my fault. He said, I saw Dog. I knew that this was going to happen. I, I, I brought this on. And, and so, and so we're, when we looked last week and we were you know, critical of David, in, in the fact that he's seeking refuge in the wrong places. He's not really looking for help from God. He's looking for someone to take care of him and rescue him. And now he really comes clean. He says, this, this, this is my doing. I, I allow this to happen. Do you know? What does that mean? Well, I don't know. It means maybe he shouldn't have been so deceptive and tried to, to, to deceive and did deceive Ahimelech into, into, into helping him. But he's now accepting responsibility for that. And, you, you know, when you think about his life, I mean, something like that, man, that would be tough to reconcile. That would be tough to, to deal with in, in the course of your life. The fact that you bore the responsibility for that. But we do have here in this moment where he seems to recognize that. And then he says this. He says, stay with me. Do not be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me you shall be in safekeeping. And, and, so, and so David, David reaches out to help this guy. Why? What, why? What, what is, if you are the one priest that escaped, what's your almost certainly going to be your destiny? What, what, yeah, death. They I mean, it probably, if, if, they, if they're aware that somebody got away, then absolutely, you're going you're gonna to face the same thing. And so for that reason, David says, I, you know, you're, you're safe here. I'll keep you. So, so a couple of really important things. And I believe this is what really is the evidence that David really now has, 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 has renewed his commitment with the Lord. That he is, in, in a sense, a new man. Because two things happen here. One is repentance. He has repented. And, and the fact that he admits this, this happened because... Of, of what I did. I saw Dog there. And, and, and so this is my responsibility. And the second thing is good works. What's the good works that he does? He, he reaches out to Abiathar and offers protection to him. And so David's renewed commitment to God is proven through repentance and good works. 
And so chapter 22, I think, really becomes this kind of uh, important kind of turning point for David. We're, we're uh, going from being on the run. Now, that doesn't mean that things are going to get easy for him. It's, it's going to continue to be a, a struggle. But, but there is this understanding now that, that he needs to trust God and depend on God and not be seeking his own, his own uh, welfare, but, but looking at it.